All right. Hey there, folks. Even with book tour and conventions back on track, I figured I'd still bring book tour to you. So welcome to Russ's Rock and Roller Coaster, season 10, intriguing interviews with creative minds. Well, from Sherlock Holmes to Philip Marlowe to Jim Rockford and Veronica Mars, we are forever fascinated by stories about private detectives. But private eyes aren't just characters in crime fiction. They're out there every day dealing with cases or suspected cases of true crime. So what better way to get an insider's view than with tonight's guest, my pal and real life PI, Scott Fulmer. Founder of Resolutus Investigations, Scott is a private investigator working both in the public and private sector and is the author of the true crime book, Confessions of a Private Eye, My 30 Years Investigating Cheaters, Frauds, Missing Persons, and Crooks. Welcome back, Scott. Hey, Russ. Nice to be here. All right. Uh, just a, a heads up to the folks at home. Feel free to send questions or comments for Scott uh, in the chat box throughout the show, and we'll get to a few at the end. Also, please be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel to get all the latest updates. Just go to any of the videos and click the subscribe button in the lower right corner and you'll be all set. All right, Scott, as we always do, let's start at the beginning. Where were you born and where'd you grow up? I was actually born in Washington State at a Navy hospital outside of Seattle. But uh, my parents were from San Antonio, Texas. So they were up there because my dad was stationed at Thule Air Force Base in Greenland. I don't know how they ended up in Seattle, but that's probably another story. But uh, so grew up in San Antonio, went to high school uh, here, went to college here. Oh, and, you, uh, jump, jump, jumping ahead, jumping ahead too fast, too fast, too fast. <laughs> Come on, you're a PI. The devil's in the details. Come on. Gotta read my on. book. It's all in my book. Yes, it is. I know. So hold on. So, um, but your dad was what branch of the military? He was in the army and he was at a, this was during the Cold War. So he was at the, uh, it's kind of a radar base up in Greenland in uh, Thule Air Force Base, which was to, uh, you know, get the lowdown on any missiles that would come from Russia to pulverize the U.S. And so uh, my I don't know why they ended up in Seattle, but my mom ended up there waiting for mm -hmm. him, even though Greenland is on the other side of the world. But uh, that's but actually that was interesting. Just last week I had. Um... Uh, Joe Holdeman on the show. He's a, you know, for those of you don't know, is a famous sci-fi writer. And he actually spent a lot of years in Alaska um, during the 50s. And he was saying that back then that they were always, there was always this nervousness that they were going to get attacked by the Russians or the North Koreans, even though, because geographically, the, you know, Alaska is very, very far to the Northwest and closer to Russia than it is to New York. So right. I kind of lived with that with that fear. But anyway, all right. So you had a bunch of, um, so you were out there, you moved out to Texas. How old were you when you moved to Texas? Uh, I was just a baby. So I don't okay. even remember. I mean, all I remember is growing up in Texas. Got it, got uh, it. And you've got, and, I know you've got some sisters. Is it just, do you have brothers as well? Or just what's-, what's No, what's I am, uh, I have eight younger sisters and I am the oldest and the only only boy. Wow, wow, the oldest of nine and the only, wow, what's that like? It was, uh, well, I never saw the inside of a bathroom until I was about 14, so. <laughs> and then I was almost shocked by, uh, you know, by curling irons and blow dryers and all these other electronic things that were everywhere. Wow. Uh, it was interesting. It was, it was, uh, I, I have a good rapport with women and that's, uh, you know, when I interview women or, or things to that nature. I think it's because I grew up with so many sisters. Right. So what's the difference in age between you and the and the oldest sister? 20 years. I am I am 59 and my uh, I'll, I turn 60 here later this year. And my my younger sister is uh, 39. Wait, so the oldest of all the girls is 20 years younger than you? Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm the oldest and the youngest of all the kids. Oh, 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 oh. Years younger than me. So how old is the oldest sister? Uh, she is, well, after, once they hit 50, they don't want to admit. Anything. Right, fair enough. Okay. So I kind of lost track, but I think the oldest sister should be uh, about 56. Okay. So. 56. So how many of the sisters that, because of the age difference, you were probably out of the house or mostly out of the house by the time the youngest kind of came around. So how many of your sisters did you say, did you kind of like realistically, like you grew up with? Yeah, that's actually a good point. Probably, uh, see, Gorge and for Erica, probably the, the first four 
were the ones that I grew up with. I, I did have a sister that passed away uh, from spinal meningitis when she was two, which can be cured now, but could not be cured at the time. Right. Uh, and so incidentally, my my younger sisters think I'm the cat's pajamas, which is funny because I'm, you know, and my but the sisters I grew up with, you know, they they know me. So they, <laughs> they know the real you. That's right. <laughs> But it is weird uh, not having grown up with some, you know, the youngest, uh, the youngest three. Right. So now, I mean, do they look at you? I mean, yes. Do they look at you more as that's my older brother or is it more of like an uncle type of situation just because you didn't? Uh, grow up with them? Yeah, I think it's I think an older brother. I was uh, I was in the army at the time. And so whenever I came home from Fort Campbell, Kentucky or Fort Hood, Texas, uh, I would always come home and they'd see me and I'd spend time with them, you know, holidays and, right. and so forth. So uh, I've got a really good, I have a good relationship with all of them. I know that's not common in some families, right. but we mm. all are pretty close. Wow. So I'm I'm just going to make some assumptions. And if I'm wrong, tell me. So I would say, especially with the young, with the younger ones, because of that, the significant age difference, you know, there's no competitiveness. There's no jealousy at that level because it's just a completely different life experience. So I'm guessing this probably, um, you know, is there some sort of like added level of like an admiration because, oh, my brother was in the army and now he's a private eye and all that kind of stuff. And well, I mean, you'd have to ask them. I'm, I'm sure they're, <laughs> it's I like, well, you know, I don't really want to say, but you know, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was, uh, I was in the Gulf War. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the first Gulf War, 90, 1990. 91 and um so yeah i think there's some admiration and there's certainly respect i mean i'm the only one i'm the only brother and i'm the oldest so that's not but i, I try not to take advantage of that i try to just be a, a good uh, a good brother so uh i i was we'll skip around a little bit i, I want to hear a little bit more about um about your time overseas but so when you were a kid so what were you into like what was what kept you busy uh reading i love to read and uh you know, I think the, some of the first books I picked up were uh, Encyclopedia Brown mm -hmm. and uh, another series called The Three Investigators. And these were young adult books about young uh, boys that and hardy boys, of course, uh, young boys that that investigated crime and, and things that were going on in their in their neighborhoods and cities. And then, of course, I got into Sherlock Holmes as I could learn to read a little bit better. So mostly reading. I mean, when I was in sixth grade, I got into band. I played the trumpet and I was in band all through middle school and, and, and the marching band in high school. So I enjoyed that. Uh, I was in the Boy Scouts. You know, I think it was just kind of a typical mm. uh, 80s upbringing. Love the 1980s. It's a great decade. Wish I could go back. <laughs> no, <it's laughs> funny, I so I, I was actually a trumpet player. <laughs> And I and so I have my my one marching band story. I think it was I want to say ninth grade, maybe it was eighth. I don't remember. So we're supposed to you know play for the you know the they march in the the, the town march whatever it was to show off the teams and whatever it was. And we gather at the school, and the band teacher never showed up. Ooh, he just never showed. Not good. And we were like, what do we do? We we're like, I don't know. I guess we play. So we just said, all right, we did it. And we just kind of walked away. I can say, and the band teacher, yeah, he was fired. <laughs> yeah. What happened? Was he sick? Did he have an accident? That's, I, that's I not normal. Know. I don't know. There was like, there was all sorts of rumors, which I don't really recall, but we never saw him again. Well, that's crazy. So, so there well, you go. you were a trumpet player. Uh, uh, I have, I have it under good authority that trumpet players are the best kissers. At least that's what my wife says, so. You know what, what the way your your wife feels about my kissing should probably be a subject for another day. <laughs> All right. So, okay. So you were, so you were into, so you were into band, you, um, you were a big reader. Did you have friends? Like, were you guys, did you have friends who were into kind of the same things as you? Were you more of a loner? Like, what was that situation? Okay. I'm, I'm real, I'm real outgoing. So I had friends, a couple of, uh, had a, one of my close friends was also named Scott. And I had another friend named Eric, and I think we were the we were the closest ones. I moved around a lot when when uh, I was younger, but uh, towards the end of middle school, and uh, I know they have junior high in some states in the U.S. and right. in Texas, it, we call it middle school, and it's sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. And so 
from eighth grade on, I had the same set of friends. I was into Evil Knievel, if you remember him. The, oh, sure. The um, and watching MTV, going to the mall and, yeah. and going to movies. And, of course, the great pastime was going to arcades, which oh, uh, yeah, the best. was absolutely a blast to go in there and, and hear all the noises of all the machines. Right. And, so what was your, so what was your game? What was your game? Galaga. Oh, Galaga. my God, dude, best game ever. It is the best game. Oh, I love Galaga. Oh. Yeah, and there's a there's actually a, I learned a cheat code for it. No, no way. Uh, and that uh, if you kill a certain couple of people, if you kill everyone on the screen except these last two, right. and you let them go down the screen three times, and then you kill them, then the the uh, little aircraft or whatever they never, they don't fire at you for the end of the rest of the game. Oh, get so out of here! You die. Yeah, you die when they run in. Oh my God! Wait, I'm. We're gonna have to talk offline about that one. Yeah. <laughs> I gotta, gotta get. Gotta get that I love Donkey Kong too. Donkey Kong. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Wow. All right, right. All right. I'm jazzed up now. All right. So, so you were out there. So you were, you were going to the mall. You were, blo you were blowing up stuff on video games. You were listening to music. You were, re you were playing music. You were reading. So, why is it that did you? Why the service? Did you um, it's a good question. I had a. I had a buddy that I knew that joined and he did his, some of his training at Fort Sam, which is where they do most of the medical training for the army. And, um, I would pick him up on weekends. We'd hang out at the time. I was a little bit, just didn't know. I wanted to go to college, but, uh, you know, came from a big family, wasn't a whole lot of money to go around. And so I essentially joined the army to get the GI bill and to, you know, finance my, my education. So, and then I would go on. I did go on to get a degree in criminal justice from University of Texas at San Antonio. And the uh, joining the military has been has been awesome. It's been a, it's been good for me. So you were in the service. You went over. You went overseas. You were in the Iraq War. Did you were you in active combat, or did you not have to get involved? Like what what was your situation there? So I was yes, I was in active combat briefly. The whole war was very brief. Sure. I mean, the uh, for those who don't know, the the air combat or the air part of the mission took about a month. And then the actual ground campaign was, I think, three days. And uh, the uh, Iraqi army was pretty much routed out of Kuwait and out of uh, western Iraq back to Baghdad. So, yeah, I was there and briefly had some had some combat. Um, and uh, everybody I was with made it back alive. And thank God. Glad that's over with. So let me ask you what at the time, I mean, this is at the time, and this is now going back, you know, 30 years. Um, I have a, I have a good friend of mine who is also in the service and he was there um, when Saddam went down, actually, when they pulled down that statue of Saddam, like on the news, right. he was like standing like right over there. He was, he was actually there. Um, now he told me, and this is, so that's obviously later that at the time, the civilians, the Iraqi civilians loved American soldiers. They were like, thank God you're here. You got to get rid of these lunatics. That was at that time. When you were there, what was the sentiment on the ground? Like, what was what was the feeling that was going on over there? Well, um, all I can tell is from, because uh, I was in Saudi Arabia for quite a bit until right before the war started, then we moved into, into Iraq. And uh, just to preface this, uh, we went into, uh, to, I guess, Western Iraq and made a curve around towards uh, Kuwait City or towards Kuwait. So the only uh, Iraqi soldiers that I came in contact with were POWs mm. and, uh, you know, prisoners of war. We captured a whole bunch of prisoners of wars, prisoner of war, and uh, took their weapons away, gave them some food. It got to be that there were so many of them that we would just take their weapons and tell them to head south towards Saudi Arabia. And, um, but they were scared. They were told we were going to eat them. Um, and that really? was uh, kind of strange. Yeah. But you have to understand a lot of, uh, although at the time, you know, Saddam Hussein said he had the largest army in the world or the fourth largest army, but many of the people that we ran into were just conscripts. They were farmers. They were, uh, you know, per, uh, peddlers, merchants. They were people that had no military training at all. And uh, they were literally told by the, you know, the Republican Guard and by some of the officers that if the Americans catch you, they're going to eat you. Uh, 
uh, and uh, we did not eat anyone. Uh, we ate our MREs and they weren't that good to begin with, but no, we weren't into cannibalism or anything like that. Yes. Okay. Wow. All right. Trippy. So, all right. So you, you were in this, how many years were you in the service? I was in for four, uh, four years. Four years. Okay. So you came out what, maybe 93, 94, something like that. 91, July, July 91. Okay. So you come out. So, you know, you've got, a criminal a degree in criminal justice. You've got military four years in the in the service, so you've certainly got training. You've got experience. Um, there was a lot of ways that your life could have gone. You could have t- probably taken, you know, that um, you know that background into a lot of different paths, particularly within the criminal justice system, if that's what you wanted. But you went. You became a private investigator. Had I mean, how did that happen, and why? That's a good question. I mean, I, I did look at other uh, uh, other avenues, you know, police. Uh, I looked at the FBI, uh, the CIA, which is not law enforcement, but it's it's still kind of in that uh, in that realm. But I, I had an uncle when I was 16. I had an uncle that was a, a private investigator. and He took me on uh, a couple of surveillance jobs. And, uh, you know, I would just basically sit there and watch him. And it was pretty exciting to me. And so I guess being a private investigator is just something I've always been interested in. I right. watched the Harvard Files. That was my, <laughs> my favorite show. My mom and I would watch that. And um, I got out of the Army and decided that's what I wanted to do. And so I went, uh, got a job, uh, excuse me, went to start going to school. And then I saw an ad in the paper you know, this is back in the olden days uh, right. when uh, classified jobs were advertised in the paper in the classified right. section. Uh, it was all on, it's all online now, obviously, but I saw an ad for a, a private investigator. And uh, of course, I didn't have any experience at all. So I basically, I decided what I was going to do. I just, I just sent the guy a letter. I said, look, I don't have any experience. Uh, don't know, never done anything like this, but that means that you can train me to do it the way you want it done. And I, you won't have to untrain me or anything to that effect. Right. So, yeah, he took it and I started there part time. Did you find that either at the beginning or at any time throughout your career that your time in the service, did that, did you find that, did any of the skills transfer? Was it a sense of maybe you went into it with a little bit more confidence because you had been, you know, you'd been trained to, you know, to to deal with dangerous situations, to be in hostile territories, um, you know, you had combat training, did that, did it transfer? Was it not applicable? Just talk to me about that a little bit. Well, I think, I think some aspects of it did, uh, in terms of what I did, I was what you would call an indirect, indirect fire infantryman, which is mortars. I, I had the 81 millimeter mortar, you know, 106 millimeter mortar. So, not a whole call, not a lot of call for mortar fire in the civilian world, but right. uh, a lot of the aspects of the army, uh, getting up early, working hard, uh, not waiting till whatever ha- you like. For example, when the first day of the Gulf War, when the ground war started, our uh, unit, our, our uh, vehicle broke. We were in a what we call an APC, which is a a uh, a small a vehicle a track vehicle there's no tanks on it it has a mortar on it anyway it broke and so you know in the civilian world you might say well i guess we'll come back to work on monday and see what happens and they'll fix that and in the army you fix you handle it right away it doesn't matter the time of day or anything and so we went got it fixed and then uh went back out into the war and so that was something that i i approached approached with in the civilian world was the ability to just uh to work hard to handle problems as they come up. Um, also, just I guess after the war, I was able to just kind of be more relaxed about stuff. <laughs> I would, I would think not less, not too worried about things. And uh, right, right. I hope that helps. Yeah, and, and build rapport. I, I, you know, in the military, you you deal with people from all over. I mean, from Guam, from New York, from Kansas, California, and uh, everybody's different. And so you you're in these units where you sleep together and you eat together and you're all in this enclosed spaces. And uh, so you have to really get along with people or you're going to get in fights with them. So that's something else, building rapport, which is absolutely critical in the private investigation field. 
Right. Just one last question about the time in the service and we'll move on. So obviously being in this service and particularly in a war is a unique situation. And especially you're saying there, you know, your team, there were no casualties and thank God. So it probably builds some sense of camaraderie. Are you, do you still have, you know, your classic, you know, my old army buddies, do you have guys you stay in touch with or did you kind of just go your separate ways? Actually I do. I, my, uh, my Sergeant, Believe it or not, I know this is going to sound like it's out of a comic book, but his name is Sergeant Slaughter. Oh, come on. I am Sergeant Theodore Slaughter. Uh, <laughs> lives in Colorado. Uh, after I left the Army, he went on to become a Green Beret, Special Forces. Wow. And uh, I have, uh, him and I caught back up uh, probably eight years ago, and we uh, message each other pretty much weekly. Uh you know, we've had dinner together, you know, visits and things like that. So it's and okay. it's really cool All right. to, to pick up uh, where you left off like that. Wow. All right. So the big reason, one of the big reasons I wanted to chat today is because you've been at this for quite a long time. And for Scott, he wrote this book, Confessions of a Private Eye, uh, which I read cover to cover. Um, and I got lots of notes to go through. But one of the things that you say early on, and it struck me, and I've actually, I use it in my own fiction, and I've talked about this, is that you describe being a private detective as really being a spy for hire. Why do you describe it that way? Well, I mean, uh, I'm trying to sell the sizzle, not the steak. That was the right. first part of that. <laughs> uh, you, you know, I, I'm uh, I'm pretty laid back and, and pretty pretty conservative in my uh in the way i live and all but uh you gotta be you gotta have uh when you write a book it has to be sexy and uh life isn't always sexy that's sometimes life is routine yeah <laughs> but uh you know uh, uh, it's a spy basically what you're what i'm doing is i have a client who has a problem and the problem can be solved by information typically just by finding out some information or providing some evidence. And so I, then I go about doing that. And in most cases, not all cases, sometimes you're interviewing people and they know why you're, they're being interviewed. But a lot of times you're doing surveillance. It's covert. People don't know they're being watched. And so you, like a spy, you are gathering that intelligence and providing it to your client. So that's why it sounds, it's similar. Okay, fair enough. So one of the cases that stuck out to me, and it, it might have been the first case you mentioned in the book, I don't recall, is um, was the kidnapping case that you worked on involving a child named Cruz Guzman. It was a complicated situation. Um, why don't you tell folks a little bit about that case and how you worked it? Yeah, that was uh, that's actually chapter one in my book, and um, it was a pretty long case. Uh, before I before I do, let me say that in my book, I have changed all the names, the locations, all the details have been changed to protect the privacy of individuals. However, in my mind, I remember the actual case. And so sure. I try not to get it mixed up. Right. So just <laughs> so, so set the scene for us. So what year are we talking about and where are you? Uh, so I think in the book, I am in Utah, so we'll just leave it at that. That's an right. investigation in Utah. It, it actually didn't happen in Utah, but we'll leave it there. And I think the year was, two, man, it was about 2004, somewhere in that, in that range, time range, time frame. And um, a client came and indicated, uh, the client actually were, was the grandparents of this uh, young boy. And I think he was six or seven, seven or eight, somewhere in that in that area. And um, the, the grandparents uh, came to us and what had happened was the father, their, which is their son, the grandparents' son, uh, he had custody, legal custody, all custody of, of the boy. The mother had visitation only because she had alcoholism, uh, drug abuse, some other issues in her life that prevented her from having a normal relationship with uh, her child. And what had happened was one day she came to pick him up at school in the middle of the classroom. She bursts in, grabs him, takes off and basically kidnaps him. It's, a, it's basically what we call a, a non-custodial parent kidnapping. And just for the record, uh, the stranger kidnappings that you see on TV and things like that, extremely rare, two, three percent of all. I mean, very, very rare. 
that those things happen. They do happen, but it's just very rare. Most uh, kidnappings are uh, that that involve children involve an uncle or a relative, one of uh, the father or the mother. Right. Right. In this case, yeah, in this case, it was the mom. Okay, so so she comes into the school. She's got a history of, you know, erratic behavior, alcoholism. She snatches the kid right out of class. Then what happens? She takes off. Uh, police come, but it's too late. And uh, so the, the police are trying to find them. And and the police, uh, of course, do a good, uh, you know, they try to do the best job they can. But while they're trying to find uh, him, they're trying to find out who defrauded somebody else and who, you know, arrests someone here and there and testify in court. So they have so much stuff that they have to do. The police are, are, are kind of overworked and they don't always have the resources. And so eventually after not being able to find him for a couple of months, this is went on, uh, she calls us. She calls a private investigation company and, or, and uh, or the grandfather did. And then uh, we end up meeting with him, meeting with uh, the boy's father. And so we're going to go ahead and try to find him from there. We're going to see what we can do. And these cases are really difficult, uh, primarily because children, you know, they don't carry cell phones for the most part. Uh, and there were no cell phones back then. Uh, they don't uh, actually, uh, was there? Yeah, I don't think so. Uh, they don't have records. They don't have credit cards. And so it's very difficult sometimes to find them. And so we ended up finding uh, the sister of the mother. As I know this sounds convoluted. Sometimes I need a Venn diagram or a flow chart. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I figure it out myself. But. We found the sister and uh, we did a surveillance at the sister's house. The sister looked a lot like the wife, the woman who stole, who took the child. Right. And to make matters worse, the sister had a son about the same age who also looked like her sister's uh, son. Oh, so that just made this so, really complicated. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, you can't grab the wrong kid, that's for sure, because then you'll be arrested for kidnapping and uh, that's not going to do me any good. We don't want that. Right. All right. So, so, yeah, go ahead. So you've got, um, so at this stage, the grandparents have engaged you. There's some complicating elements just within that family. So they say, okay, this is, this is the situation. So what do you do? How do you, how do you, how do you, especially at a time when technology did not, is, was not at the same level that it is today. And we're talking about, you know, a small child, um, how do you, what do you do? Like, how do, how do you, how do you find a kid like that? Well, the, the, uh, I've got a, a good friend in Arizona that's a PI. He used to be a, a, a U.S. Marshal. And they have a saying behind every man, behind every fugitive is a woman. Uh, unless the fugitive's a woman, I guess. But anyway, behind, a, behind every fugitive is a woman. It could be the, the fugitive's mother. And so we kind of focused that. We knew that she's going to contact the sister uh, at some point, the sister lived in an apartment complex that was uh, people lived there were on the lower socioeconomic scale. It was it was uh, so it could it was a little bit difficult to watch because you know they were, a lot of people are always out on their balcony. People were doing drug deals, things like that. So they're very wary of what's going on. You know, strange cars, that type of thing. Uh, so we did surveillance on her for a while and didn't or not was not successful. Uh, but excuse me, then we got a tip, and uh, it's a tip that ended up uh, busting the whole thing open for us. I won't tell you how we got it because it's kind of one of our uh, ways and our, our strategies for doing work. But we discovered that the uh, mother was going to a certain business on a certain day to pick up a W two for taxes. And so we decided to go and lie in wait. And I had, uh, I was there, I had another investigator with me, and I actually also had the father of the boy. And normally you would not bring the client with you because only bad things can happen when the right. client get emotional, you know, right? Just really bad stuff. But in this case, uh, we needed him to uh, positively ID the boy. Right. Uh, Otherwise, uh, we would we could be in legal trouble. So we went we went to the business, showed up, and for a few hours, nothing happened, and it was uh, it was really gut wrenching. I remember uh, just sitting there and I mean looking. And there's a couple of ways in from the parking lot, looking for cars, looking. Finally, um, 
I see a vehicle come in. I think it's her, but it parks out of my sight and out of the sight of the other investigators. But uh, suddenly I see the, the wife and her sister and one boy ascending these stairs up into this office building so she can get her W-2. Mm-hmm. And um, I waited. At the, the, the plan was to have the father say, yes, that's my boy. And then we grab the child. In this case, uh, my phone, my cell phone, actually, we did have cell phones, but my cell phone never rang. rang. It was a flip phone. One of the, right. There were no yeah. smartphones. So uh, I've been doing this so long, I forget. Um, and so they went in the building. As soon as they did, I called the client. He says, oh, I didn't, I didn't see him go in because, you know, he's not an investigator. So I said, all right, as soon as they come out, you need to let us know uh, whether that's your boy. And uh, they were in for 20 minutes, something like that. And the mother and the sister come out and they stand on the top of these stairs and the boy starts hopping down, you know, like kids do. And the father calls, says, that's him. That's my kid. So we run out. He grabs the boy and we we get him in the car and he's getting ready to back out and go. And she. I don't know what she did, but she runs up and grabs the key out of the car from him. And then her sister comes and blocks him. So, so we're, we can't go anywhere. And he's stuck. And uh, right at that point, we don't want this uh, scenario. We don't want anything to really, de- we want it to, we want to keep it status quo. We don't want it to, to uh, escalate. escalate into something mm-hmm. very bad. So I called the police. And I had the police show up. I showed them the legal paperwork. They, we talked to the father. I will say that it took about the it took the police about seven minutes to get there, and that was the longest seven minutes of my life. Right, waiting for her to just lose it. Um, but he 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 held he had the boy on the back trunk of his car, and he was holding him, and he was not letting go. Anyway, the police showed up, and the police, in case you don't know, and you may have experience, your uh, your listeners may have some experience with this. They usually do not want to get involved in what they call civil matters. It's a criminal matter. Yes. If it's a civil matter, you know, divorce, uh, this custody issue, they don't usually want to get involved. And so they call child custody services, the CPS. And uh, they had them come out and and the officer told me, he says, we're going to whatever CPS says, that's what we'll do. And so when the CPS investigator came out, she was a woman, probably 21, 22, very young, which is about right, because those uh, it's a really, really tough job, and those people don't last very long at it. And I showed her the legal paperwork. She talked to the father, and she went and talked to the mother, and then she went and talked to the, uh, the boy. All three of them were in three different police cars. And the, the father, our client, was, was handcuffed, which did not, you know, which concerned us a bit. Uh, and it took... It oh, took oh, oh, oh. Go, go, wait, go, go back. Why was he handcuffed? Uh, I think because he was a male, because they were afraid that he might uh, get violent. Oh, jeez. He's a really bad guy. You know, I don't... But, you know, people get crazy in these kinds of situations. So uh, they should have handcuffed her, but they didn't handcuff her. They handcuffed him. Uh, and I will say that these cases are, the sex doesn't matter. I've had the women were, was was the bad person. The father was the good and vice versa. Right. So there's no, uh, no, neither sex has a, uh, has a, a corner on, on that kind of thing. But they, uh, she went and talked to each of them. And I'm sitting there waiting. We're standing there by our car and they, the police told us to stay where we were at. They went and talked to uh, the, uh, the police, the, the the CPS investigator, and I can hear blah blah blah. I hear him talking, but I can't understand what they're saying. And the next thing I know, the police officer goes to the car where the father is. He uncuffs him, and said, and then he tells me we're going to turn the boy over to the father, which was the legal way of doing things and how it was supposed to be. And then we had to get out of there. Uh, what I didn't want is want the mother to follow us and and do something violent. And so. I asked the police officer, will you hold her here until it was about 15 minutes to get out of town? Not out of town, but get out of the area. And so we did. So we uh, we got the heck out of that area and drove through several lights, across town to the other side of town, 
and we went to a uh, it's a Hardee's or an A&W root beer. I don't right. remember. But we met the parents of the of the client, the father, you know, the grandparents to the boy. And the grandparents had provided the funding. They had provided the money for the investigation. And uh, when they walked in, it was amazing to see the boys' reunion. It was already awesome to see it with his father, but it was able. It was really neat right. to see his reunion with his grandparents. And one of the one of the best things that happened has never never happened before before, and it never happened since. Is that? Uh, the mother, or excuse me, the grandmother came over to me and she did not speak English. She spoke Spanish right. and uh, my Spanish is really bad. So I didn't even try. Uh, but she looked and at me, looked me in the eyes and hugged me. She kept saying gracias and mucho gracias and thanking right. me. And uh, we never get thanked as PIs. I mean, right. <laughs> it's the way it goes. Right. And so it was wow. really fantastic to. Uh, Whatever uh, happened with the mother? What's that? What happened with the mother? Um, I believe she ended up uh, losing pretty much all of the uh, of her, her custody and ended up serving some time. I don't remember exactly what happened there. Right. Uh, our, our part of it was over. And that's kind of what happens if we're doing an insurance fraud case. Right. We do a surveillance. We provide it to the client. That's it. Right. Unless we call, testify later, we never know what the outcome is. Right. Is that is that weird for you or do you not care or? Yeah, it is weird. And I have testified in court several times. Uh, and so when you do that, at least you get a sense of how of some closure. Right. On the case. Uh, but a lot of times we don't have that. Wow. So you sort of have to just live with the sense of I did what I was hired to do as well as I could do it. And whatever happens, I have no clue. You just sort of right. have, to, you just have to live yeah, with I'm it. A cog. We're a cog in a wheel. The right. attorneys are a cog in the wheel. We're right. all different. Uh, aspects of it and so uh yeah that's kind of we just try to do the best job we can all right so let, let's switch gears completely Please. So, so for a stretch of your career you've been doing cases that involve um uh, government clearance and if i recall there was there was a scene and it, it might have been the girlfriend of one of the men you were investigating and she maybe was a bit um friendly and how she answered her questions. To set set up the scene for me and tell and tell us what that was what was going on there. She was friendly, <laughs> very friendly. I tried to be. So so, so what, I, what so you were so tell us where you were and what what was the specific case? What were you doing specifically? Like what was going on then? Okay, I don't recall uh, where it, where I said right. it was in the book. So I'm going right. to tell you where it really was because okay. I don't think it really matters at this point. Um, it was. Uh, uh, near Texas A&M. It was in Bryan College Station, Texas. Bryan and College Station are two cities in Texas that, you know, it's like going from, uh, you know, L.A. into any other part of, uh, you know, any other part of L.A. Uh, but uh, that's where Texas A&M University is. And at the time I was conducting national security background investigations for the government, I was technically a private investigator but the company I, I was doing it for was a huge government contractor. And so we carried, even though I was a private investigator, we carried federal credentials and, uh, and we did national security investigations. And so just to, so people know what it is, anybody who is in the government, not everybody, but almost everybody who has a federal government job is investigated before they get the job is they have to have a security clearance and then they are investigated every five years to maintain that clearance. And that means talking to their neighbors, their friends, ex-wives, ex-husbands, uh, school teachers, people that grew up with, pulling records, all kinds of things like that, landlords, whatnot. So this particular case uh, at Texas A&M, they, they actually have a small nuclear, uh, nuclear reactor and they have a, you can get a degree in nuclear science. And so a lot of people that end up joining the Navy to work on submarines or want to work for the Department of Energy, they go to Texas A&M. And this is what this guy did. He was getting a degree in, uh, in um, nuclear engineering. And so he had applied for a government job. And I think it was with the Department of Energy. And so he 
needed a security clearance. And so I was the one doing the background investigation. So anyway, I go to his uh, uh, apartment and his, uh, it's off campus, which is all right off campus from, uh, from uh, Texas A&M, which is, if you've ever been there, it's huge. It's a very, very big campus. It's basically like a small city. And he, he lived right off campus in an apartment complex. And I, I pulled in and you know got my credentials, got my notes, went out to knock on the door. And I meet his uh, girlfriend and I meet him. He's this very, very serious cowboy guy from from Texas, mm -hmm. small town in Texas. And, and he's, you know, she's the exact, uh, exact opposite. She's very bubbly and happy and things like that. Very outgoing. And um, I needed to interview him because there is a bar at Texas A&M called the Dixie Chicken. And he had received a, uh, a citation for public intoxication. And whenever that happens, you can still get a clearance, but you have to, I had to pull the record, look at the record. I mean, I had to see how many times this had happened. It only happened once. And then I, I needed to interview him and interview uh, the people that were, were with him just to find out what the situation was. Um, you know, was he an alcoholic? Was he somebody that yeah. drank all the time? That's gonna not going to be good right. if you have a right. So you get up, so you go up there, you go to the apartment and you talk to her and what happens? So I talk to her first and he goes upstairs because he can't hear. He's not supposed to listen to anything. So she sits down and she has a very low cut shirt. I think she was about 19. He was about he was about 23. So she was very young. Uh, clearly, the prefrontal cortex was not fully developed here. So she was fully <laughs> developed, but the prefrontal cortex. Was <laughs> OK, so I go through this, my my uh, interview and I'm, she's saying yes. And she's very happy and she wants to be helpful, which is normal. People want, you know, she was hoping to marry the guy and mm -hmm. she was really wanted him to get the job. And um, there is a series of questions we ask, and, and uh, I'm going through all the questions and, and uh, you know, ask, uh, is he someone that would be uh, that would be liable to be pressured by 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 spot, you know, by in the espionage or outside influences? And, I, and she said, oh, no, 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 silly. And uh, it was getting a little bit unprofessional at that point. And then I asked her the final question. And then she she turns to me and she's wearing a mini skirt. And she turns to me and she, she says, uh, is there anything I can do to help him get the job? And then she spread her legs and it was clear that she did not wear, had not, had not any underwear on. So uh, that was shocked because uh, I, I, that doesn't happen. It may happen on TV all the time, right. uh, but that's the one time it happened to me. And I, uh, I, it took me about a second to kind of rec uh, realize what was happening. And I, you know, I quickly said, no, I said, no, that's no. And um, that's not going to help him either. <laughs> did, did he get the job? Uh, I think he did. Again, didn't find out. There would be, there would have been no right. reason for him right. not to. Right. Okay. All right. He was a good guy. But I did report that to the, uh, to my manager uh, in case the woman later on, you know, said I had harassed her or there was any right. type of. Right. Okay. Like that. So, yeah, that was, uh, that was crazy. So you never know. All right. So one case I, I want to talk about, um, we're going to have to get to it sort of quick. It sort of really surprised. One of the elements surprised me involved um, warehouse theft. OK. And so we don't have a lot of time to get into all the setup. So just set it up real quick. But there's 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 just one point at the end that I, I want to get to it. So there was a if I recall, it was um, it was a warehouse with I think it was. It was Spanish food goods. Am I remembering that correctly? It was the Great Tortilla Caper. Yes, the that's it. The, to the, to the Great Tortilla Caper. Yeah, it's a company. It was a company that uh, provides uh, Mexican food products to uh, grocery stores and restaurants, and they had a shortage. Right. There was there was there was some chronic theft going on, and um, if I if I recall correctly, you know, you'd kind of set up a system where you ultimately you were watching those guys at night and you kind of found out it was an inside job, correct? So there, yeah, we did. There was actually, believe me, I worked twice for this company. It happened once and they didn't do anything about, you know, we told them you need to do background investigations on employees, but they didn't want to spend the money. So then it happened again. So you're probably referring to the second time with all the people involved. Yeah, right. so basically we got set up. Uh, I had one investigator on the roof 
of this adjacent warehouse looking down. Uh, and I was in a uh, vehicle around the corner, so I wasn't able, it was the only way we could do it because these guys were very, very, very careful. And what happened, we went through several times, evenings, nothing ever happened. Finally, one, though it's one night, it's about midnight, and all these cars show up and they, these trucks and vans show up and they start parking right next to each other. They show up out of the blue. Uh, like the Italian job with the Mini Coopers where they're going to load the gold in, right. all right. line up. And then out, they, and out of these cars come women and children, which were the wives and children of these uh, employees. They all go into the warehouse. Mm. A few minutes later, the employees, the wife, and the children all come out just carrying boxes of tortillas and salsa and all kinds of Mexican food. They put them in the car and take off. And they were selling and, what, like at local bodegas and whatnot? Yeah. I mean, since their cost was nothing, right? Uh, they were selling them for pennies on the dollar, but everything they got was profit. Right. And come to find out that the, the ringleader was the their manager, the night manager at the warehouse, and he had done the same thing at a previous company. Right. But again, they didn't do a background check on them, so they had no idea. So if I recall, though, the thing that kind of blew my mind is that even after this happened and you recommended to the ownership that they install, right, do background checks and install a security system and he still refused. Is that right? Yeah, they, they did. I mean, uh, it's it, it's a it's a very large company. If you go to the grocery store, you would see their products uh, in my book. I call them Caliente Sabrosa, but that, I just made right. that up. It's an right. actual company. And uh, yeah. Uh, and it, the, even the guy that hired us was the local uh, director. Right. And he, he was, he said it wasn't up to him. He said that he made the recommendation, but they didn't want to, they didn't want to put, they didn't want the cost. So ul to. ultimately they determined it was worth, it was cheaper for them to get ripped off sometimes than to put in a better security system. I don't know if that, that's how they would have put it, but that's exactly what <laughs> it is. <laughs> See, so. Well, yeah. And if you know anything about employee theft uh, at, at uh, any kind of business, more things are stolen by employees than by shoplifters. That's, right. that's right. Five. That's right. The, you know, your uh, shrinkage. All right. So so real quick, um, one last question on this. So what is the death house? The what? The death house. What is, uh, what are you referring to? Oh, I don't, maybe I wrote it down wrong. All right. Never mind. We'll, 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 sk we'll skip over to that. Um, one real quick thing. Uh, oh, okay. So okay. many of us watching tonight are writers and fans of crime fiction. So talk to me real world. What is the most, or just give me one, what's the most common gadget you employ and how critical is it to your success being a PI? Uh, I'd say the computer. And it's critical. Didn't used to be that way. It used to be the phone. Right. Uh, but now it's the computer uh, for searching records. Email, sending emails to people, setting up schedules, you know. Okay. Kind of thing. okay. All right. Okay. All right. Well, that was great. But now it's time for a special segment on the show where we spin the wheel. On the wheel of seven possible categories, which I created especially for this panel. Wherever it lands is what you get. And the categories are known unknowns, fashion statement, theme song, PI flip-flop, hard pass, PI redo, and put me in coach. You ready? I'll try. All right. Who knows where it's going to land? What? Whatever you get, you get, and you got put me in coach. All right, what do we got here? So if you had the chance to be part of any investigation throughout world history, what would it be? That's a good question. Probably Watergate. Oh, really? Why that one? Uh, because uh, there's just so many nuances to that. I watched All the President's Men the other day. Mm, great uh, movie. Off and Robert Redford, just a great film. Uh, but... Uh, just the way it happened, you know. They, these guys are are caught burglarizing the Democratic uh, the Democrat uh, uh, warehouse or, or office, and it kind of goes downhill from there. So it sure does. All right, just a quick interlude for those who came in a little late. If you have any questions or comments for Scott, put them in the chat box, and we'll get to a few at the end. All right, so. Um, I've customized a few of the next se sections. I tweaked them a little bit for you. So first we're going to go to our advice column. All right. If you were to offer any piece of advice to authors who are writing about private investigators in one form or another, what's one detail or aspect of the job you think is most important that we get right? Building rapport with sources and people. Mm. There's plenty that gets that's wrong. Uh, you know, uh, if you look at television and books, 
private investigators are all divorced, alcoholic loners. Um, you know, and there are some like that, I'm sure. But uh, I think building rapport, being able to talk to people, being outgoing. Most PIs are outgoing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, because if you can disarm people, get information from them, it leads you to where you want to go. Okay. Yeah. All right, so our next section is old dog, new tricks. The saying goes that you can't teach an old dog new tricks, yet every professional I know, including myself, has made numerous mistakes along the way in their careers. What's one private investigator mistake you made that hurt like hell at the time, but you learned from and endeavored never to make again? Well, I wish I'd never made it again, but I, I still make it. Uh, it is being on surveillance and being burned by the subject you're following. Mm. I had to follow somebody from out of town. I was very proud of myself. It's the very first, one of the very first surveillances I did. They got them to their doctor appointment and they all looked, they turned around when they parked and waved at me and said, hello. Oh. So uh, they knew I was behind them the whole time. So I try not to do that anymore. <laughs> so speaking of that, and I, we may have spoken about this the last time you were on. I mean, I have to imagine sitting in a car for hours on end, you know, it's boring. You probably get, you know, lethargy steps in. You could be distracted by, you know, a twig falls on your windshield. The sun beams in and just kind of catches you in the eye or you spill coffee on yourself or whatever. I mean, how often is it just, honestly, you just look the other way for a second where you just, just for, you doze off for two seconds. And that one second you look away is the time that the person you're surveilling walks right past you or drives away. I mean, is that a real thing or like, what's the, what, what's the struggle here? Talk to me about that. It is a real thing and it happens more often than you would, you would like it to happen. Mm. Um, the nature of surveillance, when you're watching someone, you're watching a house or you're watching a door or you're down the street, you don't always get the best, have the best view. Uh, sometimes you're just waiting for a car to come down a road, but you know, I listen to podcasts uh, when I'm, or listen to the news or listen to podcasts when I'm uh, on surveillance. Uh, but you really can't read books or do anything that would take right. your eye off the road. But, right. you know, we have to use the restroom in the vehicle. Right. Uh, we eat in the vehicle. And so there's, there's always times where you're turning around and doing this and that. And, but it, it does happen. And, and it's very frustrating. And it's hard to explain too, when you, uh, you know, you've been there for seven hours and then poof, you know, they do a Houdini on you. Right. So what's the magic number for, um, for a, so you work a shift on surveillance my, and maybe I'm, I'm making this up, but I thought I heard or one of the PIs I spoke to said that optimally you wouldn't want to do longer than a four hour shift. Is that right? Is that wrong? Like, I don't know. You tell me. Well, uh, there are four hour shifts, but they're typically eight. Typically eight to 10 hours is what you would normally do. Um, six to two or six to four. So it's either they turn out to be really long days. You have to get there early because you want to follow your subject out of, you know, from where they live right. and, or you follow them from work or whatnot. But uh, yeah, it's typically eight hours. Sometimes it's four, sometimes it's 10. The longest I've ever done one, I think was something like 21, no, 24 hours. I did a hmm. overnight four hours. Can you actually stay awake for 24 hours and be functional and concentrate? It was rough. Yeah. But I mean, uh, when it's dark, you know, overnight, if the person left, the lights would have come on and it would have been pretty obvious. So Right, right, right. Okay, fair enough. All right, so now I'm going to give you some truth serum. I got 10 questions for you. You ready? I'll All right. do my best. Favorite flavor ice cream? Uh, Rocky Road. Ah, good one. What's one food you will never eat ever for any reason? Um, uh, uh, Rocky Mountain Oysters. Ooh, ooh oysters. <laughs> nasty. Bucket list destination anywhere in the world? England, London. All right. Scariest movie you ever saw? Parts of The Exorcist. I haven't even seen the whole movie and I refuse to. Fair enough. If you could have one superpower, what would it be? In my line of work, invisibility would be awesome. No, I bet it would. <laughs> Do you play any musical instruments? And if not, which one if you could? Um, I just play the radio. I used to play the trumpet, but that's uh, no, no more instruments now. All right. iTunes. What what which one if you could? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Um probably the guitar. Oh, fair enough. Cats or dogs? Uh 
I mean, that's a tough one. They're both, uh, I would have to say dogs in the end. They're loyal. All right. Favorite cocktail. And if you don't drink, your go-to unwind beverage. I do not drink, but my go-to unwind beverage is the Diet Dr. Pepper. <laughs> oh, I'm a Diet Dr. Pepper man myself. All right. Yes. You can see a live performance, sports, music, theater, whatever, any seat, any venue, any time in history. What's your choice? Oh, that's easy. The Beatles. Where? Uh, yeah, I've gone to lots of concerts. Not Shea Stadium, simply mm -hmm. because I know someone that saw them there. And Man, it, was, no. it was so loud. The sound Bedlam. was terrible. Yeah. Uh, I'll probably Abbey Road when they played on the roof. Oh, okay. Let it be. All right. Okay. Um, if you could get even just one more season of any TV show ever, what would it be? Breaking Bad. Oh, that's a darn good one. I got you there. All right. Uh, we got a quick minute. We're going to take some questions from the audience. I don't see anything in the chat box. So I had one last question I wanted to, um, I wanted to ask you. So you've worked obviously at hundreds, thousands of cases over the years. What's the craziest lie someone ever told you while working a case? Uh, well, I've heard a lot. I mean, I've heard lots of them. And, and as you, when you do that, you, uh, you get to know how people react. Probably was a guy, it was a guy I was trying to find and I, I knew about his tattoos. And when I found him and talked to him, he had the tattoos and I said, Hey, it's you. And he says, no, it's not me. And I said, I'm looking at you. I'm looking at your tattoos. And I showed him a picture of him with the tattoo. He goes, that's not me. I said, that's you there in the photo, right? He goes, no, that's not me. So uh, that's probably the craziest thing I've ever had happen. Okay, that's bizarre. All right, so we're almost out of time. So I'm going to share my screen. So bear with me, guys. Let's see, what do we got? We got here. Okay, so Scott, so here's your book, Confessions of a Private Eye. We talked about it a bit. Um, so what now what was your impetus why you know why why did you decide to put this down to paper i mean there are lots of private eyes and they don't write books uh you're right i mean some do but uh most of them don't i think for me it was it was uh, cathartic to be able to sit down and write my mother my late mother was a published author and uh, she wrote uh you know uh, thrillers and mystery fiction this obviously is nonfiction. But I'd have people, you know, whenever I'd fly on uh, airplanes, people ask me what I do for a living. I, they'd always say, you should write a book. And I started blogging and it kind of turned in from a blog to a book. So it was just nice to be able to get, all, get it all out on paper. Well, it was very cool to uh, check out a bunch of the cases and kind of see some of, uh, you know, the threads of what go on there. Um, so where can folks buy this book? Well, you can find my book at, on Amazon. Uh, you can go to Barnes and Noble, and if they don't have a copy, they'll certainly order it for you. Sure, it's available in uh, uh, in for Kindle for any kind of a audio book or book reader, right. okay. as well as trade paper, and it's also now out in hardback. Cool. Do you think you got one more book in you? You know, people have asked me that, and uh, I I don't know. I I think I might, but at this point, you know. Uh, this is writing the book is as close to childbirth as I'll ever get. <laughs> Very difficult. You should know you've written several books, but yes, I only wrote one. Yeah. And it's uh, it's hard. It's a very yes, tough. tough yes, deal. it is. All right. Fair enough. Well, you know what? I enjoyed reading it. I thought it was very cool. And if anyone's interested in kind of getting a little bit more of an inside scoop of uh, what it's like to be an actual PI, uh, I suggest that you check out Scott's book. All right. As for me. Um, if you're up for a little twist with your private eye fiction, I'll encourage you to check out my ongoing series featuring hard-boiled intergalactic private eye Angela Hardwick, who in my mind is part Blade Runner, part Doctor Who, part Atomic Blonde. The first three books of the series include Crackle and Fire, Fractured Lives, and Hot Ash. Uh, these are all standalone mysteries, so you can read them in any order, doesn't matter. But there is some character development, so your mileage may vary on whether you want to jump in um, based on the plots or if you are a purist and like to start at the beginning. And also, and I thought this was pretty darn cool, I have to say, um, this just happened last week. So CIFWA, that's the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers Association, sent out a tweet, totally unbeknownst to me. I only learned about it afterwards. And they said, in regards to fantastic fiction, Dirk Gently did it so well and, and Angela Hardlick Hardwick currently does too. Well, if CIFO wants to put my Hardwick series side by side with Douglas Adams, one of the most iconic sci-fi authors of all time, who am I to disagree? The Hardwick novels are available on Amazon and published by Crazy A Press. And the fourth book in the series, which I'll be announcing soon, 
will be available in September. Okay, so that's our show, folks. I want to thank my pal Scott Fulmer for stopping by, and I want to thank everyone who's watching at home. I'm your host, Russ Colchimiro, and as a reminder, please be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel, and if you want to see me in person, I'll be appearing at Heliosphere this weekend in Piscataway, New Jersey. And of course, I will see you all next week. Thanks, everyone, and take care. Bye now.